And the topic is, should I stay or should I go? And this is either for yourself or for someone that you care about. Um, I'm Cynthia Perthuse and I'm an elder care strategist and the owner of Senior Care Authority. Today, I'm gonna walk you through a fairly comprehensive view to help you make one of the most important decisions of your life. So I wanna start with giving you a brief overview. My, my team helps older people find a safe and healthy living option when they are ready to find a community that caters to their specific wants and needs. We also work with families that want their loved one to stay home but need help with all the required resources. We work with people in the five boroughs of New York City, and we work with people on the Southwest coast of Florida. We work with a nationwide network and we can help find assisted living anywhere in the United States and Canada. So I hope that this first slide with this musical reference will speak to some of you. In case you do not know them, The Clash were an English rock band formed in London in 1976 and were a key player in the original wave of British punk rock. They became widely referred to as the only band that matters. In January 2003, the band were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 2004, Rolling Stone ranked The Clash number 28 on its list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. They had two songs that were American friendly. One is called Do I Stay or Do I Go Now? And the second song that was American friendly that hit the top 40 was Rock the Casbah. So on this slide, you will see some of the lyrics from the song, Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? While I am sure they, are not re they were not referring to a move to assisted living, these lyrics sound very meaningful when looked at during a discussion on moving to assisted living. One of my favorite pieces out of this stanza is where it says, if I go, there will be trouble. And if I stay, it will be double. So come on and let me know. And what I'm going to talk with you about today is how to let somebody know and how to make sure that there's not trouble. So with that, we'll go into something that's a little less musically inclined. Are you in the place of making a decision to stay or go? You may hear that no one wants to go to assisted living and that everyone wants to stay home. However, I want you to open your mind and remove the no one and everyone thought. In 2016, there were over 1 million adults over the age of 85 living in community housing. And that number is only going to increase with the aging population. There are various safety issues with staying at home, including a change in health status and mobility issues, as well as isolation. And isolation is the number one cause for a decline in the elderly and in their health. I want to spend just a few minutes on some vocabulary to make sure you're familiar with it. First, ADL. ADL stands for Activities of Daily Living. These are the basic daily activities that it takes to live a full life. It includes bathing and toileting, dressing, getting from place to place, preparing and eating food, taking medications, We'll discuss these throughout the presentation. The next term is medical evaluation. This is what will be required to move into a community living model. The doctor will fill this out after a brief visit with someone that is preparing to move. This is a very good time to have the doctor speak with your loved one about how important it is that they do make a move at this time, if it's appropriate. Then finally, Caregiver. Caregiver is a very important term to know. The caregiver is the main person taking care of the health and well being of the person that is moving. The majority of caregivers are family members. Most of these family members, members never expected to be a caregiver and they haven't been trained to be a caregiver. You may have hired a home health care aide or a companion for your loved one but you are still making those decisions and you are still considered 
the caregiver. There are several different types of living options that are what are called community living options, which is what we're going to speak about mainly today. The three living options on this slide are very different. They're different from each other, but more importantly, they are different from your mother's or grandmother's or father's or grandfather's nursing homes. Each option is easy to understand if you focus on the name independent, assisted, memory. So in independent living, we all want to stay independent and some of us have probably even been accused of being too independent. This is a community that is either formal or informal and inclu includes people that need little if any help with the ADLs or activities of daily living. Again, these activities include dressing, eating, personal hygiene, walking, remembering activities, medication. Independent living is the lowest cost, but has the highest responsibilities. Independent living can include housekeeping services and some meals and activities included in the rent payment. Independent living does not include any care component. Assisted living. Assisted living is just what it says. It's assistance with living. This is a newer concept that was developed in 1984. Maybe you need help with bathing or you can't really reach your shoes to tie them, or you need help getting to your walker or wheelchair, or you forget what medicine to take and when to take that medicine. You need assistance living. Assisted living always includes housekeeping, laundry, all meals and activities in the rent payment. There is an additional payment called care that varies according to how much care you need. And last on this page is memory care. Memory care is for those with more advanced dementia, including Alzheimer's. The payment for this care is the most expensive and includes 24 seven care. None of these should be confused with skill, skilled nursing, rehab, or a nursing home. Those are separate types of care. For the purposes of this webinar, I will use the term assisted living interchangeably and will refer to all of these options on this page as assisted living. The decision to stay or go is the same with each type of living option. So let's talk about the urban legend of assisted living, the elephant in the room. The number one thing I hear from my clients is that they are not old enough to move to assisted living. Very regularly, when we take a tour, the future resident will walk out and say, those people are way too old. What will I talk to them about? We have nothing in common. How many of you think that you are younger than your objective calendar age? My friends and I regularly talk about how young we feel and act and look. However, at the end of the day, we are all slowing down. And I can say that at age 60, I do not have do the same things in the same way that I did at 30, nor can I physically do the same things in the same way. There is a concern about loss of independence and control. We are afraid and our loved one is afraid that they will lose what independence they have left and that they will be locked up and abandoned. They are worried that the food will taste like cafeteria food for old people and be mushy and bland. They can't imagine sitting around and playing bingo all day. Before I help to dispel these rumors, let's talk about the signs to watch for in making a decision about whether it's time to stay or whether it's time to go. This slide will give you an infographic around the signs to look out for when making decisions about assisted living. We're going to discuss these in depth in the next few slides. 
Remember that this is a webinar and that this webinar will be available online in the next few days. And I will also send these slides to you so that you can refer back to this chart and refer back to the discussions that we're having. There's a saying in my household that we are all one fall away from disaster. As we age, our balance can take a hit. We become more frail with fragile bones and joints and we are much less resilient. Are you seeing new bruises on your loved one that could be a result of a fall? Is there visibly more pain when they're trying to stand up from a seated position? Do they not wanna get out of bed? Falls are not just about slipping on ice or wet surfaces. It is not just about tripping over the edge of a rug or down a step. It is not just tripping over a rambunctious puppy or an aged dog or the circling cat. While it is all of that, at this age, people can fall by simply turning to get something out of the cabinet and losing their balance. Let's talk a little bit about wandering. If your loved one lives in the suburbs and is still driving, are there unexplained dents or scratches on the car? Have they lost the car at the shopping center? Are the neighbors finding your parent walking down the street to the grocery store, but without the proper shoes or knowledge of where they're going? If they are in an apartment, is the building staff or the neighbors finding them on another floor? Is the doorman having to turn them back repeatedly to go back upstairs to their home when they don't know where they're going when they get to the front door? If you're in an apartment, do not rely on the building staff to keep your loved one in the building if they are confused. It is not their responsibility and it's a dangerous option. When you visit, is your loved one not only in the same outfit this week as last, but does it smell like they've had those clothes on since you last visited? Are they shaving, bathing, cleaning? They may tell you that they're retired and they don't have to shave anymore. They may tell you that they bathed yesterday, so they don't want to take a bath every day. They may tell you they're not going anywhere today, so their clothes don't have to match. All of those things may be true, but there comes a time when the, it, you go a little overboard with those excuses. They may tell you that they always get cold and that the air conditioning is set too high, so that is why they have on winter clothes in July. Do they forget their medication? How is their medication management? You may use a pill box with the days of the week printed on it from Walgreens, or you may use a more sophisticated technology model, or you may just have the pill bottles where your loved one goes and takes the pills they need every day. However, if all the pills are still in the little box or in the pill bottles, or if there are no pills in the little box and no pills in the pill bottle, there's a problem. If the pill boxes seem to be up to date and you find stray pills around the home, in the silverware drawer, on the back of the sink, in a book or a magazine, laying on the counter, these medications are not finding their way to the patient. When you walk into your loved one's home, are you hit with a wave of unpleasant smells? Are the newspapers piled up outside or inside the door? Are there stacks of mail with some marked urgent or in other ways denote unpaid bills? Does the electricity, gas, and water work or have they been cut off? Are there bags of candy and snacks around but no indication that a real meal has been eaten? Are there groceries in the cabinets and refrigerators? Or refrigerator? Are those groceries expired? When was the last time the trash was removed? 
Let's talk a little bit more about the ADLs. Think about what you do every day and not necessarily in this order. You get out of bed. Can your loved one get out of bed? You make a trip to the bathroom and you bathe, wash your face, comb your hair, brush your teeth, use the toilet. Can they take care of all of these toileting tasks? You pick out what you will wear for the day and you put those clothes on. Do they have trouble making decisions about appropriate clothing? Can they put the shirt on over their head and fasten any buttons or snaps or ties? Can they put on their pants and work the zipper? You go to the kitchen and you fix yourself some breakfast or a cup of coffee. Can they find the right food? Can they prepare it? Can they remember to turn off the appliances and the oven? After you're all ready to go for the day, you go out the door and you participate in your activities. Maybe it's exercise, a walk around the park. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to do a volunteer activity. Maybe you're meeting up with friends. Maybe you're shopping. Maybe you're going to a movie. Does your loved one have things to do all day or do they sit in their chair and watch TV and nap? Do you find your conversations with your loved one to be on a repeat track? Do they tell you the same stories multiple times in one visit? Is their voicemail filled with collection calls or financial scammer messages? Are they depressed and just can't get out of their funk? Is the cat and or the dog looking hungry and skinny? Or the cat and dog looking fat? Maybe they're not getting fed or maybe they're getting fed too much. Is your loved one sad about the future? Do they talk about the future or do they just dwell on the past? The nighttime can be the scariest part of the 24 hours for an isolated elder. As they say, it's always darkest before the dawn and it gets really dark for someone that is living alone and is feeling unwell. They can develop a true fear of the dark. They may develop insomnia from sleeping all day. Your phone may ring more in the night than during the day. Worse, your loved one can begin to call 911 for things like food and help with utilities are falling. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but we should look at it again. What is your loved one eating all day? Are they losing weight? Are they feeling sick? Is there expired and spoiled food in the refrigerator? Are there snacks laying all over like candy and chips and things that don't necessarily have a nutritional value? Is the freezer filled with ice cream? There are other bad habits that may be developed that you may not have noticed before, like heavy drinking and smoking. The elderly are very susceptible to prescription drug abuse. The Oxycontin crisis is not just for the young. Everyone has been affected by the overuse and abuse of painkillers, including the elderly. Is your loved one beginning to accumulate items or hoard? Are they spending too much money? Is the heat too high or too low? Are the windows open all the time, year round? So let's talk a little bit about the caregiver risk. Caregiver fatigue is normal and constant. The caregiver may develop ways to avoid unpleasant situations, including taking care of their loved one. They may become anxious to the point of stopping their own pleasurable activities. On the other hand, they can begin to watch every little thing with their loved one and attempt to perfect their being and their care. 
Thoughts of inadequacy and thoughts of harm can also overtake the exhausted and overwhelmed caregiver. These are, these are also signs that a move is beneficial so that the caregiver can become the daughter, the son, the spouse, the friend again, and enjoy the company of their loved one without being responsible for their care and their well being. So, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to dispel some of the urban, urban legends. So, let me try to dispel these. Assisted living is not a prison. It is a safe and healthy place to have the help and support that you need or that your loved one needs to assist in living a full and safe life. It is filled with peers and there's a certain bonding that occurs as the resident talks about their pleasures and pains as well as their family and their previous life. The re other residents within assisted living are all going through very similar situations, very similar loss, feeling of the loss of independence, feeling of the loss of privacy, feeling abandoned. But the model in assisted living is a social model, which means there is a lot of activity, yet there is private time. Doors are locked for privacy, and there are spaces within the large assisted living communities that offer privacy, like small sitting areas, small areas in the library, small areas in the dining area. Many people call assisted living cruise ships on land with activity directors and chefs and physical fitness while underpinned with medical oversight. Friends and family are the most important members of the care team. It is important to build a team and we'll discuss some other members for that team in a future slide. So we talked about that elephant in the room of whether to stay or whether to go. And as they say, there is one way to eat an elephant and that is one bite at a time. I like to make a moving decision once we've passed the do you stay or do you go into three buckets, where, when, and how. First, where would you feel comfortable and where would your loved one feel safe? Visit locations before there is a crisis. The worst time to make a decision is during a crisis when your loved one is in a rehab facility with a broken hip and you have limited time before they're going to be required to move. Make sure you're working with a consultant who can guide you through the questions and decisions. Second, determine when you would make the move. Are there circumstances that dictate the move? Does it need to take place in the summer because the family has more time? Does it need to not take place in the summer because the family doesn't have any time? Do not let a health crisis be the determining factor on the when component. And finally, in the third bucket, think through the how. How will you make the move? How will you have the conversation? How will you pay? There is a webinar that was, uh, that I did in April that is how do you pay for assisted living? And there are a number of other webinars that can answer some of these questions about how to make the move and how to have the conversation that you should go look on the PSS website. So a little review, quick review. A part of making the decision is selecting, uh, hold on, let me, let me back up. Keep your strength and your stamina in gear for this process. It is a process and it will take all of your energy to make the decision. And then if the decision is to move, it will take even more of your energy to get everything in place. Make sure you are surrounded by your own support system of family, friends, and experts. So a part of making the decision is selecting the appropriate living option. Move to the lowest level of care that is appropriate, but make sure there are higher levels available. Independent living is the least expensive, but also has the lowest level of care. Memory care is the most expensive, 
but when warranted, it's a lifesaver for everyone. Think about a smaller room as a way to save money. Remember that the resident will not be there much during the day as the activities will keep them busy. So as we've discussed through this presentation, there are several experts that you need on your team. Some charge a fee and others can provide services at no charge. I may sound like a broken record, but the key is in the experts. You cannot and should not do this alone. If you are interested in some recommendations for experts, please feel free to send me an email and I can get you some information on suggestions for your specific circumstance. So now is a good time to take some questions. And if you have some questions in uh, the chat portion, let's see if we have some here. Bear with me while I find the chat, oh, there we are. Um, any questions? You can type them into the chat that we have or the Q&A portion. Yeah, um, yes, the, um, thank you again. That was a really good presentation. Um, if you have any question, you can type it in on the Q&A. Also, um, I, if you don't have the, um, if you're listening to us, I can allow you to ask the question also. Because we have one phone caller. So if you have a question and then I can allow you to ask the question. Well, it was a well detailed presentation. Here you go. We have one on the chat room. So the question is, how do you convince someone with dementia to go to a facility when they don't think there's anything wrong with them? Denial is strong. That is the million dollar question. And at the end of the day, part of that, that answer is, it may be impossible to convince someone with dementia to go to a facility, but you can help them uh, by getting them there, taking them to visit, helping them meet and greet new friends that will be their new friends um, multiple times because of the, this illness and what it, what it does to their memory. You can help them by going to respite and suggesting that they just go for 30 days while you have, um, while you take a break or while the caretaker takes a break. And a lot of times they will embrace that, that uh, regularity of the schedule that is in assisted living. Um, so the next question, how will we know if in-home care is no longer sufficient? I think that you would use the same set of uh, the same list that I gave you. If the in-home care, um, you're, you're having to use in-home care more, say let's start, you start with three hours every other day, you move to three hours every day, you're having a lot of nighttime phone calls and you're moving towards where you visualize you're going to have home care 24-7 which is extremely expensive. If you're seeing the bruises from falls that may have happened when the home care is not there, if you're seeing any of the items that I listed for you in the past 20 slides, if those things are happening even with home care, the home care is probably not going to be sufficient. or 24 seven care is going to become too um, expensive and too much of a, a financial burden. We also have two questions on the Q and A box. Okay. Let me see if I can find that box. Thank you. How can we find out about facilities where they speak other than English, say Spanish, Italian, or Korean? That is something that um, an elder care consultant can help you with. Most elder care consultants can do work for you at no charge to the family. And there are a number of communities that have uh, Spanish, Italian, Korean. They have cultural uh, specialties uh, around religions, um, whether it's um, 
the Jewish religion or Catholic. Um, you need to ask those questions, but there are consultants and experts who can answer those questions for you with a phone call because they're familiar and aware of these different communities. They visited most of them if they're if they're a good consultant and they can tell you where those facilities are that speak that language. Sometimes the language is spoken by the aides and they make sure that they, or they try to make sure that they have um, a diversity in the aides so that that aide may not be on the first floor, but they can bring them from the third floor to work with a resident who speaks a different language. But that's a good question that you should, that you should be asking. And as far as Medicaid paying for assisted living, Medicaid traditionally does not pay for assisted living. There are some programs called the assisted living program where there are some Medicaid, um, some communities that will take Medicaid. The list are very long. The waiting list can be very long, but there are a few. And then Medicaid can also pay for nursing home services um, near the end of life when there's a lot of meta, a uh, lot of a lot of health care that is required. But traditionally, for traditional assisted living, Medicaid does not pay. Any other questions? <coughs> How do you find such consultants? Yeah. There are um, a number of places that you can look to find consultants. You can um, you can reach out to me and I can send you in the direction of some other consultants that are on this team of expert page. Um, the, you can go to the AARP. You can go to the um, Certified Senior Advisors page. And Certified Senior Advisors is a group of people who have been certified as um, advisors to the, senior, to the senior area. You can go to um, you can go to different industry organizations. There is one called Orion Resource Group. And when you go into Orion Resource Group, there is, you can type in, I'm looking for a consultant, and it will come up with a number of consultants who are belong to those industry groups. There are, um, I can also tell you that as simple as Googling, elder care consultants will bring you up with a whole list. I'd prefer you just call me and let me send you in the direction because it can be confusing, but there are a number of websites that have lists of people who have been certified as consultants. Okay, so let me tell you, um, again, I just want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, I know that you took away at least one new piece of information. I want you to feel free to email me, email me at the email address that is here on the website or on this page. And I want to thank PSS Circle of Care for this opportunity. Stay healthy and focus on the possibilities and hang in there. It's a very difficult time. Thank you. Oh, there's one more last question, um, Cynthia. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, two. You implied that paying for an assisted living memory care may be less expensive than 24 hour in home care. Is that the case? Yes, 24 hour in home care that is private pay can cost anywhere from 10 to $25,000 a month for someone who is there 24 seven and is a licensed caregiver to be able to um, help with medication management, help with bathing, help with um, changing of uh, disposable underwear, those types of um, requirements can be very costly. And when you are in home care, while you could try to duplicate all of the things that you would see in assisted living, you're still looking at the isolation aspect because it's it's the um, it's your loved one and a caregiver, as opposed to your loved one being surrounded by 100, 200 different people that can provide entertainment, can provide um, social interaction, and can provide some uh, therapeutic uh, well-being. 
But the, the question before that, um, how do you find such consultants? No, not that one. Oh, is a geriatric care manager yes, different yes, from yes, such consultants? One. A geriatric care manager and consultants can both be the same. So a geriatric care manager is someone who can manage the care of your loved one and can help you find um, these other consultants as well. So a geriatric care manager is a consultant um, and consultants can be geriatric care managers. Okay, great, great questions. Um, it was a great presentation. As Cynthia mentioned, the presentation will be up the website in a week. Um, you can go back if you missed something, you can go back and review it. And also if you want to have the, um, the PowerPoint information, you can email Cynthia directly. The email is on the page right now. Um, so you can email her directly and she will send you the, the information. Again, thank you very much. Oh, this is not a question. Oh, I see another question. Uh, yeah. See. I mean, we have one to want to apply. Nursing so. home versus assisted living facility. A nursing home is, um, is a medical model as opposed to assisted living is a social model. So assisted living is, um, is going to take care of people, but not um, take care of someone who maybe has is bed bound or has a feeding tube or a catheter or um, uh, cannot eat is eating um, has a, is eating liquid foods things that are just more acute would then fall and under the nursing home care assisted living is again a way to help people assist people um, to assist people Okay, um, I think we do have any other questions. So, um, Susan, you asked if, um, how do you find a consultant? I think men, um, Cynthia mentioned if you want to have the information, she can send you a list, right, Cynthia? Correct, but yes, the question you're going to ask is you're going to ask, do you charge and how do you charge? That's one of the first questions that you should ask. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, talk to you soon. And again, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.